Magnet television. Magnet television. Magnet television. You're watching magnet television because what else are you going to do? Hey everybody, this is Ken Stringfellow, and uh, you might know me as a member of the Posies, or Big Star, or R.E.M., but now mostly, I'm a Silver Fox. There's a lot of songs uh, that I could think of that, you know, are very meaningful, uh, they're very poetic, um, they uh, occupy certain milestone placements in the development of modern consciousness, you know, the songs of Dylan, the Beatles, Leonard Cohen, things like this. Um, but I gravitate back in times of trouble um, to simpler things, uh, things that are more elemental and kind of give me uh, a peaceful feeling and comforting and um, kind of I can wrap myself up in the song like a blanket and, and I think the song for me that, that exemplifies that for myself one that I always go to when I'm bummed out and it will always bring me up is a song called Tighter Tighter by Alive and Kicking Alive and Kicking uh, we're, from what I understand a New York based uh, kind of funky pop group um, but this song was written by Tommy James and brought to the band uh by him uh, and it was a big hit it's a really great production it's just um kind of a very simple groove for the most part just a couple of chords um it's a simple devotional kind of statement um and a and a both giving and receiving you know um so that feels good and trust me it's been on the player So I uh, grew up in a, um, in a pretty small town, and I was a little bit young for the first wave of punk rock. I was only nine uh, when you know the Sex Pistols and the Damned and all those bands came out. So I and it wasn't it didn't reach where I lived. So by the time I was kind of finding my way out of classic rock, which is what surrounded us on the radio at that time. Um, I was starting to understand there were some other things out there, but they were hard to find. Uh, and miraculously, uh, one day I could pick up this radio station from Seattle, uh, which was, you know, 100 miles away. And it played uh, this song I, that I had never heard before. And it was this incredible kind of jangly, kind of almost birds-like with the way the guitar went and kind of the... I don't know, um, there was just something very unusual about this sound. It was forward thinking, but it, had, it was respectful of where music had developed to that point. It was kind of the right step uh, to take me from classic rock to post-punk. And this song was Radio Free Europe. Um, the announcer didn't back announce the song, so I had no idea what it was. Um, but it did occur to me reading some reviews um, when I was hearing about this song, Radio for Europe, in the review, I would thought, oh, that, that, that's probably the song that I heard. I think he said something kind of similar to Radio for Europe. It was hard to tell what he was saying, the singer. Anyway, uh, after months of waiting and searching and asking at my local record stores, uh, I finally found a single cassette copy of Murmur. And that really changed my whole way of thinking. I mean, it, 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 Punk had a certain simplicity to it that was clear that that energy was going to burn out kind of quickly if it didn't diversify. Um, you know, stuff that was coming up like heavy metal and stuff like that was just obviously cartoon and it had no interest to me. Uh, what I loved about this is that there was mystery, there wasn't any dogma, uh, there was it was poetic, and that for me was the way forward. So my band, the Posies, uh, got their start in the Seattle music scene in the late 80s, early 90s, which was an incredible opportunity um, and to see all that local music happen and see all those bands on their way up and 
watch the, the world kind of accept them as their own and all that was really cool um, in many ways the, the whole face of rock music alternative music whatever changed right before our eyes um, and the epicenter was our town that was really cool uh, my band got to travel around and do lots of cool things and play lots of great festivals and tour with great artists. Um, and from that point on, you know, I uh, entered the world of music at large and got to collaborate with many, many, many great artists, um, including R.E.M., who I was talking about earlier, this band that really did change my life. Uh, we were in South America and we headlined a festival in Buenos Aires uh, one night and we knew that Neil Young was playing the next night so almost everybody stayed an extra night um, well also we're in Buenos Aires so yeah let's stay an extra night um, check it out you know an incredible city uh, so because we'd headlined the night before we had you know still had our passes etc so it's kind of an incredible situation so basically I watched Neil Young and Crazy Horse from 10 feet away I suppose just standing right in the wings there's hardly anybody really minding that and people knew who we were etc um, as it happens I wasn't there with any of my REM bandmates um, but on either side of me were the two guys uh, from the opening band uh, two brothers named Noel and Liam and so we sat there, beers in hands, or, you know, like, literally arms around each other going, yeah, uh, which was kind of funny. Um, they were having a great time, but it was a really great set. Uh, they started with Sedan Delivery, which is not one of the most well-known tunes, so that was a nice little Easter egg for the fans. And from then on, they kind of just went through a whole bunch of the classics um, and, you know, stretching everything out, you know, 10-minute versions of every song. And for whatever criticisms people have made of Crazy Horse uh, over the years and saying they're sloppy and, and uh, you know, they're not professional and they're just there um, to make Neil look good or something like this is completely preposterous. This band was rock solid. I mean, psychically tight. Uh, all the endings, you know, that were spot on and, you know, Neil would hold out these long feedback things at the end of every song kind of keep everybody like on the edge for like a whole full minute of just one note of feedback and then smash it down and everybody would end on a beat. I mean, I, I just don't think there's a better rock show possible. If we're talking about rock music, um, which is already kind of, you know, it's mutated onto something else largely. Um, but if we're talking just about rock and roll, that was it. That was the, the pinnacle as far as I'm concerned. Well, I'm a, a naturally shy and awkward person. Um, I think that music is almost like a dare to myself, you know, to get on stage in front of people and be myself, which is just something I never felt comfortable doing with uh, growing up. I was always, you know, more uh, mortally shy. I just couldn't participate in public life. Um, and, you know, didn't have very many friends and blah, blah, blah. But don't feel too sorry for me. Things got better. Um, I think one of the most excruciating moments for me musically was something really simple. <clears throat> um, you know, touring with R.E.M., uh, which was really one of the first things I did that wasn't my own band um, so it was a big step up into a level of professionalism in, in terms of the presentation and the size of the shows and we're doing live TV and all these kind of things that you, know, you really had to be on and um, I grew a lot as a musician but I was pretty green when uh, I came into the band and they were great about it you know they knew what they were getting I mean they could have gotten anybody in the world to play with them and they chose someone with my particular aesthetic and my particular level of experience because I think I would kind of proceed to their music more innocently in a way and and um, maybe more sincerely I don't know uh, well I'd earned quite a bit of trust uh, and we had a song in the set called Walkin' Afraid that 
had mutated from the album style version to something live that was had an intro that was just Michael and myself. So, and he sang this intro, which is basically like the chorus of the song, but slowed way down. And it was just accompanied by me on Hammond organ. So I would kind of swell in, you know, there's a volume pedal that you move with your foot, swell in the, the first chord, and then he would start singing. And I would have to kind of follow him. And, and he would always play with the timing and, and draw things out. And it wasn't in any particular solid meter. He would really just kind of get it very dreamy. It was great. And then the band crashes in, you know, with the right after that intro is done. Well, we'd set up to play this show in Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square, sorry. Mm, public speaking. Uh, and it was, a, you know, this... Uh, big day in honor of South Africa and Nelson Mandela and he was there and uh, all these huge names performed uh, as a free outdoor show but set up in a place where they don't normally have shows so it, you know it wasn't something we had total control over sound wise and we you know we'd line checked and everything was kind of cool and and this was going to be the first song we play for whatever reason so I could tell something was a little weird. We'd line checked, but things had changed. This can happen. And I could hear in my monitor the the motor of my Hammond organ, which is not something I normally hear. That meant that whatever microphone was on the speaker enclosure, and the speaker enclosure for the Hammond is buried way down below the stage because it's quite loud, was turned up way too loud. Um, and so we start the song, and I just, just you know, I... There's a kind of zero to one level of this um, volume pedal, and as soon as I got to one, it was like way too loud, and anything below one was going to cut off the sound, so I was basically screwed. I had like screaming loud Hammond organ, and, you know, 75,000 people out in front of me, and Michael completely... I can't hear anything he's doing. I can't really see him either because of the keyboards on top and I have to look and I'm kind of like looking over and he's way down in front. So I can't, I have no clue what he's doing and I have to kind of guess and we get, of course we get off from each other and I'm just dying a thousand deaths, you know, and, and I see him kind of look back, you know, uh, like thinking like, are you on drugs or what? What's going on? And he had no idea what I was going through, of course. Um, and we got through it, but I was so mortified, uh, you know, all I wanted to do was do a good job. Um, and I was taking it much more, um, not seriously, but I was feeling way worse about it than was really necessary. Everybody's like, everybody understood, but oh my God, then I had to go through the rest of the show feeling like this chump, you know, who um, screwed everything up and it was kind of terrible. Hi, this is Ken Stringfellow, and you're watching Magnet Television. Sine.